Welcome everyone. This is concurrent session 1A, which um, includes individual papers focused on textiles of Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, my name is Lauren Whitley. I'm one of the co-chairs of the symposium and I'm very thrilled to host this session. Uh, I want to uh, just give you a heads up about how this works. Um, we have um, six speakers today and I will be introducing each speaker. Um, and there will be opportunities for you to add questions on the Q&A button below. Since we're over 100 people attending this session, um, I will be scanning those. We may, we may not be able to answer anywhere near that many questions if you'll all send them in, but I will try to um, gather uh, really relevant questions. And also, as Caroline Charik mentioned, a big welcome. There are many opportunities for you to connect with our speakers here through the app. Um, you can actually directly um, connect with questions if they do not get answered in this session. So thank you for um, joining and, um, and we look forward to having an excellent session. So I'm going to um, not give full bios also because this is all available as well in the program guide. So please look for more detailed information about our speakers uh, in that. So we're going to start today with um, Adriana San Roman. And her paper topic is called From Birth to Death, The Silk Flower Industry in Mexico. So welcome, everybody, and let's get going. I want to thank the Textile Society of America for this space to talk about one of my passions, silk flower making. So let's begin. Since very early times, humans have needed to depict the world in they live in. We seek to own those beautiful things we see make them permanent, make them stay. Even though we know they're ephemeral, by imitating them with strutier materials that can be preserved for a longer time. Flowers, both natural and man-made, have diverse meanings in daily life and are essential during the rites of passage in every corner of the world. They accompany individuals from birth to death. Band colors and fragrant smell, flowers are one of our favorite things. But how can you make permanent something such as a flower? In this presentation, I will talk briefly about how humanity made this possible and how a craft, or as I call it, a productive tradition, traveled from the Far East to the West and its transformation to keep it alive in the post-industrial revolutionary world. Finally, I will delve into a family story to understand how these complex artifacts are still part of our modern life. So let's begin in China, where near a millennium ago, the Chinese civilization found a way to imitate natural flowers. Using complex materials as woven silk fabrics, natural dyes, and animal or plant glues, they recreated what they saw. The oldest silk flowers that I have found evidence about were recovered along the Silk Road Trail and are dated back to the 17th century. Seven, seventh, sorry. Surely, this technology was not new, but the material characteristics of these objects make the cave their worst enemy. It was through this commercial route that the silk flower making techniques arrived in Europe, where, as in China, the harsh weather during winter makes nature dormant until spring comes again. There, this artifact's popularity was huge among the elites who could afford to buy silk and having specialized artists to assemble beautiful adornments, both for spaces and themselves, or maybe even buying them as exotic imports directly from the merchants. At least from the 14th century, one of the most desirable activities for elite maidens, along with embroidery, singing, and drawing, was the knowledge of silk flower making. Up to the 18th century, silk flowers remained as part of the elite's exotic delights, where they used them as house decor, bouquets, and corsages, in fashionable dresses and hats. In the New World, silk flowers were also used by elites, and we should take a brief look into the Spanish monastic life and the Mexican feminine cloisters where the nuns, before being ordained, made headdresses and bouquets to accompany them through their passage ceremony and reuse it at their funerary services. 
Archaeological evidence of these objects has been found in Mexico and it has been on exhibit at the Santa Monica Museum in Puebla City. For more than 10 centuries, both the use and manufacture of silk flowers remained mostly unchanged. Nevertheless, Queen Victoria and the Industrial Revolution changed the world together. Her Royal Majesty's style, as well as the way she thought the world should work, made a huge impact on how people around the globe did things. The industrialized fabrics and the discovery of artificial dyes, glues, and the greater assortment of metallic alloy wires made the world of silk flower making a dream come true. From then on, every color, form, and flower were possible, even those which were merely works from the imagination. The process's mechanization resulted in lower prices and the sort of massive production that allowed not only the elites, but the growing burgeoisie to have access to such goods. Once and all made by handcraft, the silk flower makers adopted and adapted machinery and new products to their trade and invented a whole new way of craftsmanship. Even though it was not one of the most important industries, silk flower making was big business and it allowed a great part of their workers to do their tasks at home. Due to the manual skills needed for almost all of the processes, the factories, at least in the United States and in Mexico, hired mainly women with better wages than other fields, being then a pioneer industry in women empowerment in the 19th century. During this boom, our story begins. Judith Deschamps and the Tien both of them florists and entrepreneurs, met at the State Fair of Texas and International Exhibition, and there they got married. They lived in San Francisco, California, and after the 1851 Great Fires, they decided to settle down in Mexico City, where a friend of theirs had established a couple of decades back the first silk flower factory in the southern country. Political and social instability caused by the constant internal warfare left Mexico with a never growing and the traditional industries were practically paralyzed. Therefore, the government, to revive the local economy, gave facilities to immigrants to settle and start businesses and industries all along, with the, uh, all along the Mexican territory. One of the most prominent migrant groups were the Barcelonet from France. For the late 19th century, the Mexican elites preferred French goods and style, making them a sign of good taste and quality, propelling the construction of Paris-like buildings in the Mexican capital. All this assured the acceptance and success of the steel flower industry. It is important to notice that one of the most recent feminine education institutions in Mexico, San Ignacio de Loyola Vizcaína School, held special artificial flower making lessons. Nowadays, we are trying to identify some of those students who were also once workers at the factory, or if the techniques taught there were similar to the ones used in our case study. Alfonso Cas established the first silk flower factory and he located it in the very heart of the city. When the Pucho arrived, they associated and after a few years, changed the site a few blocks to the south on the same street other Barcelonets had their businesses. Finally, they bought the establishment and, the, and then changed its name. Being entrepreneurs, Judith and her husband Etienne took the business in their hands and made it stronger inventing and patenting machines for different processes and products of their trade, being reckoned even by the Ro British Royal House, but also engaging in the vibrant and hectic life of the constantly growing Mexico City, which then, more than now, seemed to acknowledge migration and multiculturalism in a very different way. Silk flower making was not their only trade, and they also engaged in cultural societies such as the Philharmonic Orchestra Patronage, the Red Cross activities, and even with canoeing clubs in town. Now, returning to silk flower making, they also had to adapt those materials that were available in this country with a brand new national mechanized textile industry and with a wide variety of materials that had never been used for this activity before. Etienne, 
led the distribution and merchandising of the goods, while Judith led the silk flower production. And as I stated earlier, they hired mostly women as workers. On the records, we have found that the factory had more than 100 workers, both on and off site, and also gathered women from all ages, cultural backgrounds, and social classes. The youngest started at eight, at age eight, sorry, and the oldest left at age 90. As a young couple, Judith and Etienne had two children, Henri and Adrienne who were also engaged in the family business. As for any other trade, specialization was desirable. The newest and youngest laborers had the easiest tasks, whilst the more skilled, which not all the times were the oldest, had the most complex ones. Wages were reciprocal to both productivity and specialization, ranging from some cents a day to around eight pesos, which was way higher than for any other industry and especially for women. We know that one of the employees, Elodie, started working on this first stage of the factory and worked through the second half of the, of the 20th century. She was not only a laborer, but also part of the family as she was the godmother of both of Henri's uh, offspring. But how did they make the flowers? The production process can be divided into six separate stages, which include the base material preparation using sizing and other connections. The cutting process, which could be made by hand as traditionally, or using a special cutting machine with pre-firm cutting molds. The staining or dyeing process, which would be applied to the whole fabric, the cut pieces, or even adding details with small brushes and stamps. The gaffering stage, where each cutout was given its three-dimensionality by pressing them inside a mold or by hand using special irons. The monture or first assembly process where the flowers and leaves individually are put together and the final assembly where bigger and more complex arrangements are set. All specialized jobs were those which involved the sizing and dyeing of the materials, the monture and the final arrangement assembly. For this time, they manufactured at, three, at least three different types of artificial flowers and plants, textile-based, paper-based, and wax-based, along with many combinations. It is also known that then, both in Mexico and other latitudes, other materials were used for artificial flower making, like horse hair, conch shells, resin, eggshells, metal, and a wide variety of processed fibers, but they were not as profitable as uh, the others in the industry. There is also evidence of Etienne developing machinery and processes to exploit wooden fibers and making artificial flowers with them. We know that in Mexico City for uh, 1900, six establishments imported silk flowers three were manufacturers and five houses specialized in fu funeral flowers. For 1905, there are no commercial records except for our case study. And also in the factory's facilities, we found both catalogs and tools that once were part of the other manufacturing facilities. There is no clear data on what happened to those establishments, but they disappeared from the commercial scene. We also know that the Peugeot exported and imported both materials for manufactured and then the products, selling those two at least uh, in two different establishments listed as importers and to some of the other Barcelona establishments specialized in clothing and accessories. One of the most representative works of the factory is the one done during the festivities for the centennial of the independence during September 1910 where the Peugeot factory services were hired for the decor of a diversity of buildings, among them the government palace, where the official ceremonies were held. Using both natural and artificial flowers and foliage, they just built hallways, festive cars, table centerpieces, and also made corsages for the assistants. With this huge assignment, the business was success successful and growing, 
Nevertheless, health issues caused by the use of materials now known as highly toxic caused a big tragedy in the Peugeot family. In the space of fewer than five years, Adrienne, Judith, and Etienne passed away, leaving the young Henri in charge of the business. By himself, it took some months for Henri to get the hold of the business. A couple of years later, he married, and as the rent costs of the building that had served both as the factory on the lower level and as housing on the upper level went up, he decided to buy to buy some land in a newly established industrial sector, Colonia Obrera, which now is quite near the city's downtown. At the same time, he opened the store where they sold directly to the public, which was later closed around 1940. Henry and Refugio, his wife, had two children, Enrique and Maria Luisa. In the newly bought land, the second generation of the Peugeot family, the Sangden built a special building where each one of the productive stages had a specific uh, space. And as far as I have researched, this is, at least in the American continent, the only building designed specifically for silk flower making. This construction was also the family house. Opened around 1927 and 1930, this new space witnessed the massive growth of the business, having direct distribution to the public, continuing with its former clients and also new ones from the big screen and distributors from around the country. They manufactured jungles for movies, accessories for Catholic and Jewish religious ceremonies, corsages and buquets for social parties, they distributed silk flowers from northern Mexico all the way to the southern region, all amongst hot couture tailors, hat makers, assemblers, and specialty shops. For at least another 30 years, the production thrived as Henri continued visiting the distribution routes and looked for new clients. The seasonal production for Christmases was so big that they even had to hire more off-site workers, usually from the same neighborhood, to perform simple tasks and help to carry materials and loading packages for shipments. Henry fell ill and passed in the 1960s decade, leaving his wife Refugio and his offspring in front of the factory. None of them had the same merit their, as their predecessors, but they decided to open again a store for direct distribution to the public. Both the production and the number of workers slowly started to decline, as well as the range of clients. For the late 1960s, there were only 20 workers in sight and about a dozen off-site. Nevertheless, it was still a good business and they managed to keep some of the regular clients that made it profitable. We also have to notice that the, by this time, the fully industrialized Asiatic artificial flowers started to take over the market with great advantages on mass production and price. Enrique, the eldest offspring, was not very interested in the business, leaving his mother and his sister Luisa with all the responsibilities to keep the business running. They st still kept those good clients, but the market had almost completely changed. And after Refugio's death, Luisa stood in front of the business, not letting anyone help her but her brother. Profits and production continued to the Cape, and by the end of the first decade of the 21st century, there were only three employees on site and two off site. It was not a profitable business anymore, even though they still had regular clients and whole families that went to the store to buy because by then they had a tradition of wearing their artificial flowers for generations. When I was a child, I remembered being at the factory helping my grandmother and my mother with some others and somewhat learning some of the techniques. Um, Enrique and Luisa passed away in 2010, leaving a dying enterprise and a lot of problems with the property and with the business. The children of Enrique and Maria Luisa were not very interested in learning the techniques or participating in the business, except Luisa's youngest offspring, Adriana Peyron, who is my mother. A couple of years before my grandmother's death, I started my research, which would become my great dissertation. From then, we have started gathering information for the, from the archives, made uh, some informal interviews with some of the surviving oldest employees, and started collecting examples of different materials, types of flowers, tools, and researching more in depth this uh, business's history. And nowadays, um, we are trying to establish the business using those traditional techniques in the new market where the tradition, fair trade, and craftsmanship are valued again. 
This productive tradition has survived more than a millennium, and since then, artificial flowers <laughs> have accompanied individuals from birth to death. Thank you for listening. Our next speaker will be Suzanne McCauley, and she will be speaking on, um, the title of her talk is A Tale of Two Sisters, Invisibility, Marginalization, and Renown in a 20th Century Textile Arts Revitalization Movement in Mexico. Welcome. Well, thanks, Lauren, for uh, introducing me. And I'm really an outlier on this panel. I'm actually representing an historic colony, the New, uh, New Mexico, rather than Mexico or Guatemala, um, but of course in contemporary times. Honoring the theme of hidden stories, my presentation raises questions about the vicissitudes of fame and obscurity of two women relative to artistic creation and textile arts vitalization efforts. This is the story of two Varos sisters who married two Graves brothers and lived in rural Carson, New Mexico in the early 1930s, well, and beyond. So at that time, Francis and Sophie Varos Graves with their extended families repaired Spanish colonial textiles for the uh, Santa Fe market. Around that time, they began to recreate traditional Spanish colonial type colcha embroideries from recycled materials salvaged from 19th century colcha fragments. They also raveled yarn from 19th century Rio Grande weavings uh, that were beyond repair. And then in, in uh, more contemporary times, the Carson Stitchers would go to garage sales and get uh, wool sweaters and ravel those. These new Colcha embroideries were initially marketed as authentically colonial by entrepreneurs such as Elmer Shute, a local trader and brother-in-law to Sophie and Francis. For over 70 years, the two Varro sisters continued to create what ultimately became known as Carson Colcha embroideries, which is really a subgenre of the historic Colcha uh, uh, embroideries within the canon of Southwest Hispanic arts revitalizations. This time uh, spawned many arts revitalization efforts, primarily through WPA and other economic uh, redevelopment programs. Carson culture embroideries, however, were really a new version of this genre of vitalization rather than a revitalization. In the beginning, uh, Francis and Sophie's early work celebrated romantic visions of the West. And uh, here are two examples. Uh, Sophie's work is on the left and uh, Francis's on the right. They're both, uh, uh, Sophie's was done in the late 80s uh, and uh, Francis was uh, executed in 1990. Um, and then they later went on to do um, non-anachronistic um, compositions of sparse embroidery fields uh, populated with local flora and fauna as their designs. Uh, in Sophie's case, she uh, developed a, a repertoire of more abstract designs and, her, and was very interested in uh, a lot of unusual color combinations and her skills at dyeing uh, to achieve these striking uh, color combinations were perfected over many years of repairing rugs and matching the yarns. In 1994, which was a few years before Frances died, uh, she was awarded the highest honor a folk artist can receive in this country, which is the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship. Uh, and she's had several articles and books uh, credit, uh, credited to um, both sisters, but uh, as the originators of the Carson Colcha movement. Uh, but uh, Francis Graves was well known uh, to outsiders, collectors, scholars, and curators. And although uh, Sophie pursued Colcha embroidery all her life, she was more private, creating pieces primarily for her family and for the market in order to, to support her family. And uh, she, she didn't receive the uh, critical attention that Francis did. So the disparity between the creative lives of these two women raises questions about artistic intention and visibility, promotion and marketing, 
uh, the uh, dynamics of arts revitalization uh, movements, and uh, of course, the allure of replication. In the 30s, uh, Carson, New Mexico was a much more active and more populated area uh, with a local aquifer as its water source. Um, it was also the site of textile creation and repair, um, a large operating uh, workshop. So the Carson enterprise leaves an after image of a mixed Anglo-Hispano community integrated by familial and kin relationships engaged in craftsmanship, superimposed on a seemingly barren landscape. And as Francis once told me, everybody that was in Carson made colchas. Men too, embroidering, yes, anytime. We would embroider by night with gasoline lanterns. Carson as a community of stitchers underscores the importance of art practices and material objects in sustaining bonds between people as individuals and as communities. Lucy Lepard describes the uh, communicative connection binding a group of craftspeople as their language was in their hands. These uh, culture embroideries typify the imagery and compositional format which dominated the work of Francis and Sophie throughout their lives. Uh, they embroidered up until their deaths. In an interview in 1988, Sophie described these two cultures as being made of recycled wool in natural tones on wool sabania as the ground fabric. Quote, and there is the, all the brown and some of the white and some of the green, no commercial yarn on that one. That's one of the old ones. And then poignantly, she's looking at these in a museum and they're about to be exhibit, exhibited and she very poignantly says, um, I never did know I'd ever see them again. So it's been, when she's looking at these, it's been 50 years since she made those. Uh, she worked with her sister, they, it was a collaboration. Uh, they finished these um, cultures just before Sophie married uh, Frank Graves, and Francis had uh, already married uh, Richard Claude Graves. Uh, Sophie was 17 at the time, and Francis was 21. And one of the hallmarks of Carson-style culture embroideries is, of course, the complete coverage of the ground fabric, the stitches, and also um, they're composed of fragments of uh, ground cloth that they salvage and the recycled wools uh, that they use in terms of their embroidery. Um, but another technical feature is the parallel lines of unidirectional stitching that go up and down uh, these claws. And that gives the uh, Carson culture embroideries a fairly static appearance. And this practice, of course, was uh, derived from observing the old cultures that they were repairing. The iconography of Sophie Graves' culture embroidery on the left, depicting a wagon train arranged in a protective circle around livestock, with vertical bands of Indians going up and down here across the field, it becomes a fairly uh, a stylistic trademark of the choice of imagery of both the sisters, actually. And they continued to put wagon trains, uh, Indians on horseback, local flora and fauna in most of their um, compositions. The early 1930s culture embroidery on the right exemplifies all the characteristics of Carson culture making. And this includes the use of naturally dyed recycled native wool and the creation of a kind of a, a colonial style composition appropriating saltillo style design elements from the Rio Grande uh, weavings uh, found in this area and uh, definitely the um, elongated diamond with serrated edges and the overall kind of frenetic um, zigzag lines that extend throughout the composition. Um, they, they, the Carson stitchers knew these designs intimately because they were, as I said, inspired by 
um, the original weavings and um, embroideries that these women repaired. The Saltillo style Rio Grande frazada or blanket on the left typifies the kind of blanket that um, they did repair in the Carson workshop. The photograph on the right is from Francis Graves' family uh, collection of photographs, and it shows um, a large Rio Grande weaving that's um, about to be repaired with its distinctive um, zigzag uh, elements as well as the, the crosses um, that aren't that visible but right here. And these motifs were used over and over. Now here are two uh, cultures that were done in the early 30s by Sophie and uh, Francis. And they have uh, identical subjects, identical palettes, actually, um, composition, elements. I mean, they're very difficult to tell apart. And if you see these in museum collections, uh, they really are indistinguishable. Um, and as I said, this type of uh, imagery they used over and over again, uh, sort of uh, a typology of Western themes, uh, which was inspired by the stories of Claude Graves, uh, Francis's husband, who was a cowboy. He was a cow puncher, as Francis would say. Sophie and Francis had grown up listening to tales told by their grandfather, Juan uh, uh, Manuel Varos of uh, wagon trains, buffalo hunts, Indian raids, uh, skirmishes, roundups. So the sisters love developing these narratives in yarn. And on the left is a photograph actually of Claude Graves holding one of um, Francis's pieces and another uh, good view of a more contemporary version of uh, Francis's embroidery. Continuing to optimize um, the use of Western themes. The photo of Claude also helps uh, to convey a sense of scale of these pieces. Claude's presence in these photos suggests that collaboration among family members in terms of drawing, helping out, inspiring each other, um, in terms of choosing embroidery subjects continued on from the old days in Carson when, quote, everybody made cultures and the spirit of making stitched the community together. So here's another um, pair of cultures using the, utilizing the same themes. Sophie's is on the left and Francis is on the right. Uh, again, from that interview in 1988, Sophie enthusiastically explains um, her in, in, uh, enthrallment really with dying. And she says, I dyed the blue and I dyed the green and the yellow, almost all but the brown. That was old, old yarn that I had. I just bought the dye. It's just a commercial dye, you know, but we used to get real good ones. Sophie and Francis both put a snake in the lower sections of their uh, compositions right here. It looks like a little worm, but it does... Um, kind of inject a sort of animation and um, a feeling of um, movement um, and sort of whimsy uh, in, in a fairly static composition. Sophie gave her culture to Jane Hyatt, owner of a gallery and gift shop in the La Fonda Hotel in Taos, New Mexico. She'd moved to Taos by then and worked for Hyatt about 20 years. So during that time, uh, Sophie learned much about the local art scene, as well as the jewelry and the weavings for sale in the gallery. And many of her patrons for both the uh, culture embroideries and rug refurbishment came from people who frequented the gallery or exhibited there. Frances also moved to Ranchos de Taos on the um, edge of Taos, New Mexico after living in Carson. And like Sophie, Francis continued to repair rubs and create new culture embroideries. She also held stitching workshops and grew friendly with local gallery owners and museum personnel. Being very visibly associated with making cultures, Francis became much better known in these circles than Sophie. And even in the early 90s when Helen Lucero who then was curator at the uh, Museum of International Folk Art, and I interviewed Francis. There was no mention of what Sophie was doing at the time, and Helen never asked, 
And I assumed that Sophie was no longer making colches. Elmer Shoup, the trader, um, and his partners and brothers-in-law promoted an art form geared for tourists and collectors that drew upon symbolic resources of local indigenous groups and the heritage of Southwestern weaving. Their intent was to reduce these neo-traditional elements of ethnic emblems to simple forms with immediate visual and semantic impact. Writing of legitimacy and reproduction in the 1930s, Walter Benjamin states that authenticity of an artwork, quote, has its basis in ritual and traditional use. The Carson enterprise reproduced textiles that not only portrayed history and ethnicity, but also appropriated the trappings of ritual and indigenous subject matter, thus capitalizing on touristic expectations of an authentic souvenir of the West by transforming authenticity into the subject of art, not the source of traditional practice and ceremony, but the aesthetic measure of legacy. Carson culture embroideries were much too large to use in um, embroidery hoops. So the stitchers tacked the ground fabric onto large plywood boards in order to have a firm backing. And this is evident in the photograph on the left from the Graves family collection, showing uh, one of Francis's uh, cultures. Sophie's son, Tony Graves, has also described this common process of working off a board, whether stitching or for rug repair, and uh, how he as a child helped stitch over the ground fabric. And just below is a, a drawing uh, of, made by Francis that she used as a stencil for some of her pieces. And then on the far right is a piece uh, in progress by Sophie, which shows the drawing on the um, ground fabric that would be totally obscured by stitches um, uh, and, and embroidery. And here are uh, some um, favorite topics of, of subjects of both the, uh, both the, the sisters' birds. And the bird on the left is a very whimsical, sort of eccentric bird that uh, Sophie did. It's only a detail from a larger piece. And on the right is a piece done by um, Francis that's much more decorative. Um, also, I'm including a little drawing by Valerie Graves. The, at that point, she was the daughter-in-law of Francis. And so many family members drew for each other uh, help plan compositions. I mean, they, they, they still um, perpetuated that idea of a kind of a communal uh, uh, art practice am among the stitchers. Um, and whatever, whatever source inspired Sophie or Francis from magazine illustrations to traditional cultures, they really delighted in this whole process and in creating these pieces. Bonnie Ryan took the initiative to enter her mother's culture in a county fair competition where Sophie earned a blue ribbon. Compared to Frances's Southwestern style culture, which was used to represent her artistry as an NEA National Heritage Fellow in 1994, Sophie uses non-traditional ovals and large areas of vibrant color punctuated with exotic plant forms. Her work was intensely coloristic and more experimental than Francis's many variations on Southwestern themes of flora and fauna. As the years passed, Francis continued to attract the critical attention of patrons and museum professionals who collected her work and also wrote about her. Sophie's creative energy went into supporting her family with her textile work and sustaining them financially. Francis was adept at self-promotion and cultivating numerous friendships through her art. Sophie was no less passionate about art making, but less inclined to publicize her artistic efforts outside her circle of friends and family. Although both sisters, along with other relatives, are credited with creatively inventing 
the Carson Colcha style. It was Frances, through her culture embroideries, who eventually came to epitomize it. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Brenda Mondragon Toledo, and the title of her talk is Indigenous Textile Circulation in the Fashion Industry, a Case of Mexican Tenango Embroidery. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you very much um, for having me. So this is a research I made uh, during between 2013 and 2016. Um, the objective of my research was to analyze the processes of interconnection that exist between indigenous artisans and designers through uh, the embroidery known as the Nango, which are used by the firm Carla Fernandez in order to understand the cultural consumption of final products. So my research is looking at this relationship that exists between local spaces, looking at the cooperative .NET in El Nante, Tenango de Doria. And on the other hand, I was looking at the global discourses of the fashion industry to a specific designer uh, known as Carla Fernandez. So I, the purpose of it was to follow the embroidery pathway between El Nante, Carla Fernandez, and the consumers. Uh, so to understand this process, uh, I, under, I understand, I studied the debate that exists between fashion and art craft, handicraft, the word artesanía in the, in the Latin and Mexican con context, as well as to understand fashion and this debate that exists. Uh, and the way to the understanding the circulation of embroidery was through the study of consumption. So I was looking at the socio sociology and cultural studies of consumption. Uh, in, in, for the understanding of cultural consumption, I'm considering Nestor Garcia Conclini's uh, definition as a set of appropriation processes and uses of products in which the symbolic value prevails over the values of use and exchange, or where the latter are subordinated to the symbolic dimension. And I was also using, uh, and to understand, uh, to understand consumption as a practice, as an uh, uh, as a practice and a process. I was using uh, Bourdieu and his theory on habitus and field theory in which I was looking at the interactions that exist between field habitus and capital to practice uh, between the three, between uh, the habitants of uh, Elante, the designer and her employees, and the consumers in the field of art. Um, so first of all, I was looking to identify the agent's capital, the cultural, social, and economic capital of the agent, uh, in order to follow their actions in the fields, considering fields of handicraft and fashion, um, to finally recognize the, the consequences the agents have from their actions. It is to say, to understand the levels of agency and distinction. So my methodology for this research was a multi-sided ethnography, uh, where I worked between El Nante, in Tenango de Doria Hidalgo, Mexico City, uh, with the designer and the consumers mainly in Mexico City and the city of Puebla. So first of all, the ethnographic information is from the cooperative .NET in El Nante. It's a small, uh, it's a small locality from a municipality of Tenango de Doria Hidalgo. It uh, has a population of 364. Uh, the last census was in 2010, and the newest was done within this last, uh, in, in 2020. So the results are not out. Um, the resources of income in, in this town is uh, mainly agriculture and cattle raising for self-consumption mainly. Remittances that are brought from, uh, that are sent from their families in the States. Um, most of the people in, the, in this population, they're mostly women, and most of the men are gone. And one of the most important sources of income is the making and sell of the Nangos. Uh, the ethnicity of the population of the community of, of the Nango de Doria are Otomi, surrounded by, uh, they also uh, are surrounded by other populations, such as Nahuas. And what are, you might be wondering, what are Tenangos? Tenangos are the Tenangos. They are, they have been popularized in the last years. 
Uh, so Tenangos emerged in the 1960s as a re response to a drought. Uh, and ever since they have been making these Tenangos, they are uh, made in cotton fabric with uh, tr cotton threads, usually with a lot of colors or just one color. They're, um, they're made by freehand drawing and they are inspired in paintings that are found in a cave uh, close to San Nicolás de los Ranchos, where they are originally from. And they depict the, re the region's flora and fauna, as well as everyday life. Uh, so through the years, we can see that there are a lot of modifications of this embroidery. Um, since the beginning, the government had a lot of influence if they were made through uh, policies in which they were um, pushing for a diversification of products to find it in a, to uh, insert them in a wider market. Uh, for example, if you're designed with blankets and duvet covers, all those kind of things, uh, they have changed from the caves paintings to nowadays uh, facing face-to-face, -face, I call them mirror images because uh, I'm not sure if that's the name. Um, they were, in the 90s, the same governmental uh, institution pushed, pushed it to use monochromatic uh, penangos, as well as the use of metallic colors. And finally, uh, the insertion of new materials, which are more related with the work that uh, they do with the designer, which is materials such as silk, linen, and denim, mainly as well as other type of uh, threads. So which are the distribution channels? The distribution channels are through governmental institutions. Uh, FONAR and CVI are the main ones. Uh, there are others involved. There's also the regional fairs in the Nango or uh, uh, San Pablito Pavatlan, which is also very close. And the two cities, the two main cities of the state of Hidalgo, Tulangua, uh, Tulancingo and Pachuca, as well as uh, fairs around uh, the country in and Mexico City. They also, the distribution channel are also the intermediaries, uh, through intermediaries, they're uh, sometimes former public servants, very interesting cases, those, the resellers that are known as coyotes who come to, the, um, to towns, they buy pieces for uh, cheap prices and they resell it in other markets for very high prices and as well as foreigners. Uh, sometimes public, former public servants and foreigners are also, um, they have the same dynamic as the you known coyotes. Um, and finally, the designers, uh, in this case study, it was with the designer, Carla Fernandez. So they work with brands, but they also incursion with social media through other designers and with their, their own social media. They have direct clients that they meet through the design and through the designers. Um, and so to introduce, uh, to start introducing the work they do with the designer, uh, well, um, the designer has a social uh, has as an association called Taller Flora, and they have a uh, traveling workshop. So they have. Um, Part of the work of this traveling workshop is a bit of doing research around textiles, um, uh, also training and workshops, uh, training, for example, in the introduction of new materials such as uh, silk and linen, but also with consumers uh, to present to consumers where, where the fabrics and where the materials are coming from, how they're made, and to make a consumer more uh, conscious of what the pieces are, the, the garments are coming from. And finally, it's mainly for the purpose of design, to, um, this traveling workshop. Uh, one of her phrases is the future is handmade. So in her design, in the design of Carla Fernandez, uh, the design recovers the techniques but does not recover the iconography. In Tenango, the Tenangos, the important thing about Tenangos are the iconography rather than the technique. Um, but this designer only uses the technique. So uh, this is an example of a piece from Maya Land in 2011, where uh, the, the animal embroidered uh, was embroidered by the community of El Nante on 
on other different techniques. So um, to, we're going to go to the appropriation and resignifications of indigenous texts in the fashion industry. And for this, um, so I am asking, who, so who are the consumers? The consumers are um, Mexicans and international clients, but they're mainly over 30 years old. Uh, they're usually professionals, either artists and academics uh, connected with culture. And they are usually upper middle class, upper middle class and upper classes with a strong purchasing power. Uh, this information was gathered from the, um, the market studies from the brand and the employees. So how did, how did the designer achieve distinction in the field? Firstly, she does exhibitions around different places in, in the world, which she uses museum exhibitions as a spaces for legitimation. She likes to legitimize her work. Um, so there is a list of all the some expectations she has uh, been involved, um, and also the discourses that she has built around her brand, such as "Back to the Roots," "Volver a la Raíz." Uh, and it's to well, she has built this discourse also related to slow fashion and sustainability. Uh, and again, the phrase is that "future is handmade." So what are the factors influencing the purchasers in terms of the consumers? Um, so when working with the consumers, we found that there was, there was mentioning there is a different fashion proposal. So the, the brand offers uh, timeless collections, they're unisex and they're one size. They have an original design, which is, it is described as an original design, which is based in what she calls uh, origami textile. And this implies using the patterns of quadrangles and rectangles uh, for used in the Mexican communities, but can be found in other places around the world. Um, the high quality of the, of the pieces, uh, which is connected again with the discourses of flow, fashion, and durability. And the going back to the roots, so it's categorized somehow in the ethno-fashion trends and the social consciousness. Yeah, uh, so this research creates an important analysis for comprehending the interrelations that exist between local and global spaces. Such analysis is important in order to recognize the complexity, complexities of these relationships, which require complex explanations. This analysis recognizes artisans and designers as those with greater agency, whereas consumers have a minor role since they are the ones that consume previously elaborated discourses with the objective of creating engagement with the brand and increasing their consumption. This research allows us to understand through Bourdieu's theory, cultural consumption as a practice and a process which symbolically structures itself in the field such a dynamic demonstrates the material and symbolic complexities that exist between artisans, designers, and consumers. At the same time, it highlights the structures of power and inequality. This is demonstrated in the ways in which embroidery, symbolic, and exchange value is acquired depending on the field in which they are involved and on who gets involved in their creation sales. Their creation and sale. On the other hand, inequalities are also exhibited in the minimal or non-existent participation that artisans have in the creative processes with the brand and the reasons for this. Furthermore, the analysis of such agents' habitus, habitus allows us to recognize each individual's agency capacity in the field. It recognizes that the artisan's habitus allows them to move from one field to another while participating in both at the same time. It is also possible to identify strategies used by the artisans to accomplish distinction in their field, especially among new generations who are directly involved with clients with greater purchasing power through social media. This, um, on the other hand, through the analysis and characterization of the brand, Carla Fernandez, her business partner and employees, it is possible to recognize those who receive the biggest distinction in the fields of fashion and handicraft. Uh, on one hand, it is, it is she that gets most of the economic benefit as well as different distinctions and awards. She also gets exhibitions around the world. Uh, finally, the consumers appropriate the discourses of objects, 
which are being resignificated in order to accomplish a distinction. Their form of distinction is through the discourses of ethical consumer sustainability and sustainability. Such categories distinguish them from those who buy fast fashion, those who use luxury brands with no social responsibility. This analysis brings us to a different comprehension of what it is, is now understood as luxury, which is now not ex only exclusive but conscious, creative, made in Mexico, etc. This is how they accomplish the distinction in their fields through the garments they use and their symbolic implications. The relevance of this study lies in comprehending fashion as a new space in which artisans are involved, in which the final products are innovative, hybrid, risky and experimental garments for specific consumers. The final analysis demonstrates that the fields of handicraft and fashion can complement each other, but it is in fashion design that superimposes over handicraft, which demonstrates the inequalities between artisans and designers. Based in a structurally racist system within the Mexican nation state with vulgarist policies that have historically excluded the subjects but not their objects. Our next speaker will be Eleanor Laughlin, and the title of her talk will be The Maker's Mark An Examination of an Embroidered Reboso and Its Potential Signature. Welcome, Eleanor. Thank you. Mexican rebosos or shawls range in fiber design and function from those worn by indigenous women made of naggy or cotton and used to carry children or heavy loads to those made of silk that feature fancy dyes or embroidery which served as elegant accessories. Among the historic um, embroidered examples is a luxury subtype called the landscape reboso, which featured scenes of quintessentially Mexican locations or events embroidered into the fabric of the shawl for women of the Spanish aristocracy in Mexico. Most rebosos in the past as in the present were made by anonymous weavers. In previous papers, I have argued that this landscape reboso from the Philadelphia Museum of Arts collection depicts a dia de campo or a day in the country and is in a visual dialogue with French and Indian printed fabric due to the transatlantic colonial fashion for luxurious retreats in the countryside. While still honoring those points, today I want to turn to a subtler aspect of the story presented in the vignettes gently embroidered on the surface of this reboso, the shawl's own story and perhaps that of the maker. In this paper, I will revisit the Philadelphia shawl and offer some new ideas. Made in 1790, this shawl is a beautiful example of its type and period, featuring five bands of red angular designs created using the ecot or haspe dyeing method repeated between four embroidered panels. The haspe panels are bounded by very slender but solid stripes of color. These repeated geometric forms provide a sense of rhythm and continuity in the reboso's design. The embroidered segments of the shawl depict a variety of scenes. Boats float on the water. People dressed in an array of delicately rendered costumes reflecting the complex mix of races as in Costa paintings, interact and appear to either greet or dance with each other. Tables set with food are interspersed among the motifs and winding vegetal forms create a visual rhythm between the vignettes. These pastoral pleasures are all shown in relative perspective and scale according to the embroiderer's ability, except for one enlarged anomaly. A dragonfly depicted to half human scale along the border of the garment. Today, I argue that the shawl's weaver and or embroiderer is depicted as a repeated indigenous figure in the vignettes. And I suggest that the dragonfly serves as her signature. Through an investigation of the representational forms of the maker, signatures in embroidered samplers from the same region and period, and a discussion of dragonfly iconography in Mesoamerica, I demonstrate ways in which this indigenous figure stands out and differentiates this shawl from other embroidered examples, adding an additional layer of meaning. In the Philadelphia Reboso, visual cues made to identify the maker, the importation, and the sale of rebosos within the shawl's own design creates a system of self-referentiality that brings the viewer's awareness to the scenes of the reboso and their creation. 
thereby facilitating a conceptual space for a signature and agency in the reading of the visual narrative. The shell contains several self-referential embroidered designs, that is, rebosos depicted within the design of the reboso. Long shawls appear in the embroidered scenes a total of nine times, six as a worn garment and three as an independent object, likely an accessory for sale. In one scene toward the top left of the design, the shawl makes its first appearance adjacent to the dragonfly. Here, a woman holds a reboso across her body as if to let a couple view the handwork evident in the shawl and admire its artistry for potential pur purchase while they enjoy a refreshing beverage. Another vignette in the third embroidered band, slightly left of center, depicts a man and woman holding a shawl between them. The angle of the reboso and the gentleman's body language lead the viewer to believe they are seriously considering the shawl. Finally, in the lower right-hand corner, the reboso is used as a prop in a dance. Twice in the display of the shawl, the same woman accompanies the reboso, an indigenous woman, clearly represented wearing a wheat bill, wearing a wheat bill, excuse me. The wheat bill is a long and loose tunic that falls over the underskirt worn by indigenous groups in Mexico from ancient times to the present day. The dimensions and decorations of the patterned blue top and red skirt and the headpiece in particular correspond to depictions of similar costumes in Costa paintings. If we search the shawl for another representation of her, we find her in the top register at the center, riding in a boat filled with flowers, as if traveling to the location of the Dio de, Dia de Campo to sell her wares. The same figure is evident with the shawl in the third embroidered row and in the last um, dancing scene. In the last two vignettes, she stands facing the shawl in observation with a cane as a respected grandmotherly figure watching over her creation. Hence, it becomes clear to the viewer that one of the stories the weaver or embroiderer is telling, weaver slash embroiderer is telling in these depictions is about the sale of the object itself. Although the story does not flow in a linear fashion, there are elements explaining a voyage the display and inspection of the shawl and its use in a dance. The indigenous figure stands out in the Philadelphia Rebosos design as the sole representative of her ethnicity and class and is visually linked repeatedly to the shawl, thereby creating meta notions about not only who the scenes depicted, but who may have created them. Given the association between the indigenous figure and the finely crafted shawl, I want to suggest that she is an example of an 18th century posteca or merchant. From the 15th through the 17th centuries, the posteca were members of indigenous community um, charged with the responsibility of trading luxury goods that Mexica warriors and nobility used to indicate status and rank. Some examples happen to include cotton, mantles and clothing, and textiles as well as exotic feathers, semi-precious stones, ornaments of silver and gold for cacao and slaves. Further, it is possible that the indigenous figure in the Philadelphia shawl is not only the pochteca, but also the weaver or embroiderer of the shawl, based upon our understanding of the pochtecas, which extends back to pre-contact times. In the 16th century, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún and his indigenous collaborators, collaborators defined the pochteca in their various forms in Book 10 of the Florentine Codex. They classified the amanteca, or feather artisan, as a subcategory within the trade of pochteca, or dealers. This connection between amanteca and pochteca is not only historical, but also religious, social, and economic. In Nahua communities, noble women became leaders of craft production, especially feather work and textile work within the community. At the occasion of the Nawa girls coming of age ceremonies, leaders gave speeches to their daughters, emphasizing their nobility and the importance of their work and the production of luxury goods within the community. Therefore, it is logical to suggest that the indigenous figure in the, on the Philadelphia shawl is potentially both 
the craftswoman and the merchant of the scarves depicted within the embroidery, as well as the one at hand. This new information also enables us to conclude that the ability to perform textile work was valued and was a point of pride, something for which the artisan merchant might want to claim as an expression of agency through a signature. Additionally, the indigenous figure in the Philadelphia shawl is shown using the visually descriptive signs of Pochtecas in sources such as Sahagun's Florentine Codex and maps. Pochtecas are often depicted with footprints indicative of a long journey. Our indigenous figure's journey is shown by boat rather than by foot, but she was nevertheless taken a, on a journey. Pochtecas are shown with walking sticks. Our indigenous figure is shown with a walking stick. And Pochtecas appear with their wares, often on their backs. The indigenous figure in the Philadelphia Reboso is shown adjacent to and watching over her wares as explained above. Now let us turn to the dragonfly. Despite several examples of appropriate spatial perspective throughout the embroidery on the shawl, the dragonfly is grossly out of scale, measuring nearly three quarters the height of the nearest human figure. The location of the dragonfly, while not dominant, is certainly not hidden, placed at the beginning of the second row of embroidery. embroidery. It accompanies the first appearance of Reboso as an object in lieu of the indigenous woman. Its presence is reminiscent of Aztec name glyphs, which appear slightly above figures in the scene, sometimes attached to the person named, but not always, as we saw in the Florentine Codex. Usually, Aztec name glyphs depict, depict a recognizable object that relates to the name. Maya name glyphs can be pictographic or logosyllabic, and they can appear in the register above the human figure. It has been argued that some Maya stone monuments and stele feature signatures or name tags of the artists. In Maya cosmology, the dragonfly often represents Seashell, the patroness of weaving, divination, and midwifery. She is the goddess of fertility, pregnancy, and childbirth, and her name can be translated as Lady Rainbow. Thus, the symbol of an enlarged dragonfly, which stands as the patron of weavers and refers to a rainbow, is certainly an apt substitute for the image of the weaver embroiderer of the Philadelphia Reboso, which is the representational function of a signature. And so, this line of reasoning leads us to consider how or if the supposed signature fits into other examples of embroidered signings. Who is doing embroidery in 18th century Mexico and have other name glyphs in lieu of signatures been identified? Although few examples of pre-contact pre embroidery exist due to Mexico's hot and humid climate, surviving fragments attest to the fact that decorative stitching were applied to clothing prior to the arrival of the Spaniards. After the conquest and the establishment of the Catholic Church in Mexico, nuns kept white work available in their churches. In these textiles, the stitching is the same color as the background fabric, which was generally white linen. The term includes the technique of desilado or drawn thread work, in which the artist chooses some threads to be pulled from the background fabric, while the rest are reinforced with additional stitching. This example depicts male figures on horseback alternating with lines across a long border, likely from the 18th century, and unsigned. Since the earliest days of the colonial period, girls of all ages and classes were taught to embroider, although it was predominantly men who were offered large commissions for clients such as the Catholic Church. In 1525, a school was established at the convent of San Francisco for young girls in Texcoco, um, indigenous and Spanish alike preparing to be beatas, or women who worked for the church but were allowed to come and go within the community. Likewise, in the first half of the 16th century, women who were, quote, not nuns and were called friends, end quote, which is another terminology for a beata, um, founded the Colegio de Niñas in Mexico City to teach indigenous girls a course in which embroidery naturally played a role. The intentions of these schools were to, one, protect the girls from the sensual rapacity of the men, two, to instruct them in the Christian doctrine, three, to teach the brightest to read and write, 
and four, to train them to help the missionaries in schools and hospitals. Let us add that teaching Spanish embroidery was also an act of assimilation. Thus, the colonial period provided a system of embroidery education for indigenous and Spanish girls. Of course, time progressed, and by the 18th century, for one socioeconomic class of girls, embroidery became an art of accomplishment or a skill that upper-class young ladies used to show their sophistication and ability to create and maintain a beautiful home. They embroidered bed covers, pillowcases, tablecloths, furniture doilies, and samplers to demonstrate and practice their craft. One such example can be seen in a sampler by Maria del Carmen Huerta from 1789 in Mexico. This is an example of needlework many of us are accustomed to seeing one that incorporates different shapes, symbols, and letters in an effort to practice and record embroidery styles. The background is an ivory plain weave with multicolored silk embroidery in cross, herringbone, basket, and satin stitches, also featuring cut and drawn work in overcast bar stitch. The forms are drawn not only from Spanish embroidery traditions, such as mermaids and coat of arms, topped by a crown, hmm mermaids in the coat of arms, topped by a crown and flanked by double-headed eagles, but are also derived from regional inspiration and architecture um, and motifs that appeared on indigenous clothing. An inscription in the center showcases a signature in a classic style, and its translation reads, um, to teach Maria del Carmen Huerta in her first plain sampler the 23rd of August of the year 1789. The sampler is, of course, a very different type of embroidered textile than the reboso at hand. Former is an example of an art of accomplishment, featuring disconnected patterns made by a young woman of the upper class, while the reboso was likely embroidered by an indigenous woman to sell as a souvenir to offer a commemorative narrative for a special occasion or trip. Although the institutional intentions in providing embroidery instruction were not originally to teach young ladies a skill they could monetize, this was in part the end result, at least for the brightest of the girls. When considering differences between signatures, thank you, Lauren, in Arabic script and image, as well as differences in class and privilege, both in the historical and the present contexts, we must also consider alternative literacies, keeping our own biases in check. Writing in the Western mind is often equated to graphically recorded speech. Jacques Derrida use, argues against this type of traditional definition and in favor of a broader and more philosophical position for writing. In Of Grammatology, he explains that the concept of writing exceeds and comprehends that of language, or it encompasses language and extends beyond it. In Amerindian cultures, and certainly in pre-Columbian America, art and writing are not easily categorized. As discussed above, both Mayan and Aztec, quote, writing forms incorporate images and the Mayan form integrates sound with graphic representations. In Nahuatl, a language still spoken in Mexico today, the word Tlalquilolitzli refers to both to write and to paint, a dichotomy made more intriguing with consideration of the crossovers between the terms Amanteca and Pochteca encountered earlier. The Philadelphia Reboso presents visual systems of graphic communication. The embroiderer created at least two narratives, one about a day spent dining, dancing, and listening to music in the countryside, and the other is an autobiography. It is the portrait of a woman who makes and sells her own shawls as souvenirs to the elegant client class of women who may be creating their own samplers at home, but who will treasure this indigenous maker's work for years to come. And so will we. Thank you. We are now moving on to the final presentation of this uh, session 1A. And this is actually going to be split between two speakers, Gabrielle Vial and uh, Concepcion Pukoi Tarin. And we welcome both of them. And the title of their shared talk will be Woven Stories and Painted Books, Exploring the Worldviews and Lives of Pre-Hispanic to Contemporary Maya Women. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, I am from Samat Cobán, Alta Verapaz, Guatemala. 
it's in the map. Uh, this is my beautiful village, Samak Altavera Pass. That's where I grew up and everything, it's green. We, my, also, my father grew coffee and helps the other young men to grow coffee. It's a beautiful place to live, the waters around it all green. I have a big family. I am the 11 of the children. I got my brother and sister and half of the grandchildren of my mom. My mom taught me to weave when I was eight years old on the Maya backstrap loom with the te textile of the pig bill. It's the traditional in my town in Guatemala. My sister and I, we sit to weave every day and talk about beautiful design, what we can create with our own fingers and arm. And pig bill, it's mostly hard to weave on because we have to suck the thread in a tar cornstarch as we continue to weave to make it stronger. Otherwise, it will just break the thread. I love weaving because I can make whip pills. It takes a month to whip one whip pill. And I pay my own education with my own money that I make from my weaving. Many women weaves pig bill style, which is the white on white. And everyone can make their own and create their own designs on their own. Or some, a lot of them, we still have the traditional designs. Like the one over here, she's creating a dox and a start on her weaving with her fingers. 2004, we create a weaver group of the textile and they chose me as their president because I'm the only one who can speak a little bit more Spanish. All of the women who weaves, they only speak Mayan language, which is Kekchi. The Kekchi women, they are afraid to leave their village because they don't know how to read and write. They choose me because they know I'm less afraid than anybody else to go offer the textile outside the village. I went to downtown Kuban in Guatemala and Antigua to offer the textile that we hand wove it together. I helped them because it's mostly that we need it in our village to make a little money as a woman and pay our own education. These are the old weavers that I know when I was growing up. Some of them, they're still alive, and some of them that passed away. This is one of the blouse, the we peel, that's completely, it takes one month to weave because of the delicate of the motifs and the design that we put through all the time. This is three panels of the we peel, and we stitch together in between. This designs we call pacaya leaf. It's a mostly beautiful design that we always uh, weaving on or we peel. It looks like the plain leaf. This is a pacaya plant and it, we use on our textile. 2005, Kathleen arrived in my village of Samak to find out more about pig bill style in Alta Vera Pass to make sure it's still alive some of the weaving. New color arrived couple of years back, it's still, it's a pig bill style, but with the different colors and the designs are really de delicate to weave on. Many times people ask us, why don't we wear or hand woven all the time? We don't wear or hand woven because it's, we made a little money on it. Moved to United States, no one speak English. I don't understand what people are saying, but I continue to demonstrate my weaving as I go. One of my wall hanging, I created with different color. 
teaching other people around me, this is a placement with the diamond shapes that she created. Teaching my old chindra, children, I want to continue the Maya backstrap weaving. Selling a little bit of my textile as I go. And also this is all the looms that we use in the Maya backstrap loom. Many traditional designs start docks, chaim, patush, and crop, ishq, arch, mountains, harp, sul, ta'a, or chachpek. This is my mother's favorite designs. She always continued to weave on her new whip hill. New design is a flower, utzuh. And my original man on a horse, and the cop man on a on a horse is a copy from another we peeled. A hummingbird on a tobacco plant, nineteen thirties, and the new design that I created over here. This is the old design that I saw at Maxwell Museum Anthropology a couple months back, and it's a beautiful thing that I saw it, and I thought I will create a new one like that. Thank you. We, um, I would have asked the panelists to turn on your video again and to put your sound on. We have a couple questions. We're now in the question section. Um, and I will just sort of do them in um, order. We actually um, have a comment first by Ella Phipps. I'm going to uh, read it again. Um, so it's, it's for Adriana. Silk flowers, perhaps the speaker might look at the pre-Columbian Mexican cultures and see the enormous interest in use and representation of flowers in ritual context, question mark. She may find links to indigenous traditions rather than via Asia for early examples. Um, of course, uh, thank you for the question, Lauren. Um, of course, there are a lot of uh, depictions in, in Mesoamerican art, and um, the flowers were very important also for, for these pre-Columbian cultures. But uh, the specific tradition I am tracing, I know it came from, from, from Asia all the way through Europe, and it was Europeans who brought it uh, to the Americas. Um, actually, in the factory, I know that my great-grandfather worked along with artisans that made paper flowers in the tradition of Mexico. So um, th this wide variety is something that hasn't been studied yet. And um, I think it's also a great opportunity for anyone interested to, to go and research a bit more on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question is, and I'm going to um, hit the live button so you all can see it. The, their next two questions are for Brenda. Um, were the inspirations from regional cave paintings, were they European or pictographs? Okay, thanks for the question. Um, sorry if I didn't specify this in the presentation. So yeah, the caves are found in the, in the region around the uh, Nango Azoria. Well, one came and they're there. Okay, we have another question here. In your conclusion, you were talking about the unequal relationships between indigenous artisans and designers like Carla Fernandez. How do these unequal relationships impact communities? Do you think Fernandez's work falls into a category of cultural appropriation? Thanks for your question. Uh, in terms of cultural appropriation, I don't think it falls into into the category. Um, I also kind of think that the category of cultural appropriation is not uh, developed enough and it's not does not expresses enough the complexities of the relationship. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I, I think it's more that designers have to improve methodologies and how they work with artisans as well as. Um, there is, it, it, there's a need from the state to get involved as well to uh, improve employment benefits and legal protection for their work. Uh, in terms of what would they, how did they leave their inequalities? How is, 
yeah, how did in, uh, equal relations affect the communities? Well, mainly in, in the fact in how their products are uh, commercialized in the market. So when they are sold by the designer, they're much more expensive. Their value increases much more when they're in fashion and they're made by designers. When, when it's made by artisans and sold by them directly, their value decreases. So this is one of the many examples of how they get affected with this inequalities. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, the next two questions are for Concepcion. Um, first one, do you and the other weavers in your community dye your own yarns? We do not. We bought our own yarn that's already in colors. Okay, thank you. And um, Concepcion mentioned keeping the thread cold else, or else the thread would break. Perhaps you, uh, the speaker misheard, Liz. Could um, Concepcion, you talk more about this? What type of thread? Uh, the type of thread that we use, it's cotton gas, the very fine thread that we weave. And we are not uh, available to weave without soaking in the cornstarch first to make it stronger so it doesn't break. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have a question. Please um, do not use the chat uh, button for questions. Please only use the Q&A because other people can't see them, but I'll read it out from the chat. Um, this is a question for Adriana. Do you think that you could trace the names of the women working in the factory with those lists of students at Las Vizcainas? Um, I'm, I am hoping I can do it. Um, there is uh, an exhaustive record of the students at Las Vizcainas, and we have uh, the, the, the payment rolls from, from the factory. So that, that is something I, I am really hoping to do when the pandemic uh, allow us. Thank you. Um, here's another question for Eleanor. What is the origin of the Philadelphia piece? The Philadelphia piece is from Mexico. Um, I don't, it was a gift and um, we know that it was purchased as a souvenir. It has shows very little signs of wear, um, but we don't really know where it's from exactly in Mexico, if that's, if that's the point of the question. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Okay, we have one more question. Brenda, do you think there's a tool or something that we can use to measure when a designer is falling into appropriation? Is there a way to get at that understanding? Uh, it's a very complicated topic and that's kind of like what it needs to be work a lot in Mexico and the ways in which policies are made but we are able to see the results. So if the problem is that designers choose on their own how they're going to work with artists and at that complex, complicated because it's ethic, ethics and morals are very, um, could not be understood like by everyone in the same way. So it's very complicated. So one, uh, designers may think that just by paying fair prices is enough. Others, uh, would think that uh, working with um, including them in the creative process is enough and there's different things so in the way we could try to measure it would be to try to create a methodology that works for everyone rather than leaving every letting everyone just decide what they want to do. This is for Eleanor. One figure that looked like a male was wearing a black and white garment that looked like it was in a herringbone pattern. Can you explain if this was an indigenous garment, a cape or something? I think that you might be thinking of um, what Elena Phipps has attributed to be a priest um, because of the style of hat that he wore. Um, and Elena has, has uh, written about, about that, um, I believe just for the museum, I'm not exactly sure where that where I've seen that, um, but but she wrote about that, saying that perhaps the the embroiderer was making commentary on the behavior of the priests because they they show up to these 
via de campos or parties with um, with women. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Another okay. question for you, Eleanor, okay. um, from Elena. Have you examined other um, narrative rebosos and found similar issues? Similar issues with signatures, I presume. Um, I have I have looked at other rebosos in digital format. I have not. Um, the landscape rebosos are in collections, actually mostly outside of Mexico, and they're scattered. Um, so I have not had the opportunity to travel to to see all of them in person. Um, but I have I have looked and I have talked to curators and or um, you know collection managers and. Um, they have not noticed any anomalies that appear to be a signature either. I think it's a really interesting point though, yeah. Thank you. Great, um, Gabrielle, why don't you just unmute and ask a question? Okay, this is for Eleanor. Eleanor, I really enjoyed your presentation. That's an amazing rebozo. Um, and I love the idea of the, <laughs> you know, potential glyphic signatures. And I actually, I have some textiles from Guatemala with similar sort of artist signatures. But I was wondering about the um, dragonfly. I've never heard that being associated with Ishchel before. Can you tell me where you found that information? Um, Carl Tobe, who writes about um, myths of Maya, I think primarily Maya, but also Aztec mythology. Right. Um, it's, it's in two of his sources, actually. Okay. Um, yeah. That was that was where I discovered the connection. Um, but I really enjoyed your talk as well, and um, I definitely will look for publications. But if if maybe we can exchange emails, that would be fantastic. I would love to do that. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have one question that's directed to Suzanne. Can you talk about the textile on the wall behind you and the jacket oh. you're wearing? <laughs> yeah, it's um, besides. Uh, I'm also, I also do a lot of research in New Zealand, but this is from Fiji. It's a bark cloth. And of course it's only a fragment, even though it's gigantic. Um, and this, what my daughter actually was doing some uh, uh, National Science Foundation work in Samoa and found this whole stack of uh, bark cloth remnants actually. And she brought it home thinking it was Samoan, but it's actually from Fiji. It's very distinctive uh, types of uh, motifs that are put together. And then you can also unscramble some of the stylistic vocabulary, the shark's teeth, um, and oh, some um, emblems of journeying and so forth. But basically the Overall design is one of borders, if you really look at it. It's just borders you know, and triangles and horizontals and verticals. Oh, and did I say the shark's teeth? So that the emblems actually have meaning to the Pacific Islanders. Fun, thank you for adding that extra textile bit there. <laughs> Um, do we have any more questions? We are, um, we've got a few more minutes. If there are any others, please feel free to type them in the Q&A section. Ah, we've got one. Uh, okay, a uh, question from Elena Rosenberg. Uh, let's do this live. Concepcion, thank you for your beautiful presentation. In your opinion, how do people outside of Guatemala uh, best learn more about the stories of the women from your village and other villages with textile traditions? How can they best support their work and your work? Thank you. I think to support them, the woman in the village, it's by uh, finding where to sell their textiles because living in the village, there's not many people goes there and not many people will want it to buy because um, there's a lot of cheap clothes in the store that they can buy it instead of selling the hand woven and sell it to them for a little bit more money. So it's, I think it's best to support them by finding where they're gonna sell their textiles and um, finding how to do it and make more people to go to them to 
to support them with the textile so they can they will continue with their their hand woven great uh, another question for you concepcion when creating your weaving weaving what is your main inspiration for your design also have you ever created your own backstrap loom and where do you or where do you obtain them Yes, uh, I do make backstrap loom in my house and <laughs> sell them. With I just use a knife to to cut the edge, and I complete the whole loom. And uh, I also sell some of the backstrap loom on Etsy. Great. Hmm. I don't see any new questions. Any new questions? We've got uh, five minutes. I also wanted to mention Concepcion does a number of workshops. Um, she's done a number with my students um, in, here in South Florida. She also does them at the Dunedin Fine Arts Center. So she's continuing this um, teaching of weaving, not just within her own um, community and tradition, but also to a broader audience here in South Florida. And she does demonstrations uh, across the US. So. We have another question for Concepcion. Can you describe the wee pill you are wearing? Yes, this is the completely whole wee pill that we created. There's a lot of many designs inside. It's another tobacco, a hummingbird on a tobacco plant and a man on the horse. So this is the style of pig bill and I pay somebody out to make the embroidery around it all by hand also. The traditional in my town, Coban Alta Verapaz, it's the white on white textile, which is slowly disappearing. And we're so happy to continue to start weaving more as we can. Great. Um, there's another question here. Uh, how do panelists feel about non-Indigenous BIPOC people buying or wearing wee peels and other textiles? This, this brings up cultural appropriation again, and is it appropriate, but it also helps support artists. It's a complicated subject. Um, it's really open to all panelists, but who wants to jump in on that one? <laughs> it's very complicated. It is, it's very complicated. Um, I follow a really interesting podcast called All My Relations, and um, it features um, an in indigenous women primarily, or they're, they're the hosts or hostesses of the show. And they recently addressed cultural appropriation and um, we're speaking with a fashion designer who is a Native American you know, from the United States. Um, and, um, and she said that when people come to her and ask her, whether or not they can wear her her work because they're white, um, she she gets <laughs> she kind of smiles and says, <laughs> you know, yes, please, please wear my work because I need people to buy it. If I only have Native American people wearing my work, then you know I won't. I'll have very limited sales. Um, so I, I thought that was a really interesting um, take on it. But of course, it is it's a very complicated issue and. Um, there are very serious aspects of it as well. Um, I recommend the podcast. We have about uh, less than a minute left till we have to close this session. Um, and we have to be on time because we just have to hold our deadline. So if anyone has a, um, Brenda, did you have a comment you want to make? Yes. Yeah, about the question you made. Uh, yeah, I think what Eleanor is very important because if then there's this issue on cultural appropriation. Then who's going? Who then like we, you know, there's a need for a market to be to these pieces to be sold. And what there has been different reflections uh, is that there has to be just a reflection on what is your privilege for wearing it, and be conscious of that. Uh, but it, if just not buying it would imply like would have negative uh, implications for communities. Good point. Um, I, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you all so much. Thank you all panelists. This was a really wonderful experience and thank you all attendees. We made it through session one without 
hopefully any glitches. So um, we're really looking forward to carrying on and we uh, will resume with the next session um, at 1.30, I believe. So thank you all so much and see you in a bit.